I, every once in a while, I will reference this message. It's been quite a while since I've preached it entirely, the, at least this, this package. In other words, it changes all the time. But I do make reference to Judas very often. The title of this message is The Power of Self-Condemnation, what I call the real sin of Judas. And as we've been working our way through the one-year Bible, We've come through the Passion of Christ as before leading up to that we saw the arrest, we saw the betrayal, and it began to work on me from the inside to put together this teaching for you tonight so that I can help you understand some things about self-condemnation. Uh, to define self-condemnation, it's simple, anyone that condemns themselves. Now, condemnation in, in itself is not a positive thing, it is dark is heavy. I can condemn you. You can condemn me. Uh, we can find in religion very often condemnation instead of the conviction of the Lord. When we teach all on hearing the voice of God, one of the main things we teach is discerning the difference between condemnation and conviction. Conviction is warm and kind, whereas condemnation is harsh, heavy, and cold. It, it's frequently, if almost always, connected to something the devil is trying to do. And we're going to see that same principle here in the story of Judas Iscariot. I want to start by reading John chapter 13, verse 26. Jesus therefore answered, That is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. And after the, uh, after the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Jesus therefore said to him, What you do, do quickly. Now a lot of people see this, they look at the betrayal that was done by Judas, and it's all they remember about Judas. That's why there are no children named Judas Iscariot. I mean, you name your child Gideon, you name your child many things, but not, not Judas. Uh, not even though that name is a good name in other contexts. There were other Judases, but you're not dare going to name your child Judas. It is a pretty name, but it's scarred by the reputation of this man and what took place. Some people look at this and decide, well, it must mean that he was predestined for Satan to go into him and control him. It does not necessarily mean that. Uh, he is referred to as the son of perdition, spoken of in the Old Testament prophetically. The Old Testament does not name him Judas. And I truly believe that anyone could have been Judas. I truly believe that we all can be Judas. That all of us at one time or another, if we've not already, we may betray someone or even betray the Lord. You say, but Jesus is talking to him and he says, this is the one and Satan enters him. Well, if you recall, Peter also was called Satan by Jesus. Remember when Peter tried to prohibit him from going on to fulfill his destiny by dying on the cross and being handed over to, to men? He said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. He was looking at Peter, but he was addressing what was working through Peter, demonic entity or Satan himself. And it's the same case. Now, he may have been predisposed to channel darkness, but I do not believe that he was bound sovereignly to do this deed. Because if someone subscribes to that mentality or that idea that he would be bound sovereignly, inescapable, as the son of perdition to have to do this and play this role, then it does not match so many other passages of Scripture. But I think that he happened to be the one in a position because of flaws that he had, because of sins, and I want us to think about him and reflect on his life and then look at ourselves and we're going to consider the possibility of an alternate outcome. You know, often you hear in sci-fi they talk about this uh, parallel universe, an alternate timeline. Movie producers really use it to be able to fix things in storylines that they want to change. It's an easy way out for story writing. That's what J.J. Abrams did with Star Trek. He just come up with an alternate timeline and things are a little different, made it easier. But I want us to kind of think along those lines. What if things were different. Uh, what if Judas had made other choices, different decisions? And really, in Matthew 26 and 27, we, we follow the events of Judas at the time of this terrible act that he's about to commit. 
We're going to study it, and we're going to see seven things about self-condemnation. And before you think, well, yeah, we're going to gang up on Judas. No, I, feel, I always feel sorry for the bad guys in the Bible. I did this message this morning in the Chinese service, and I had a moment, a very emotional moment. When it was weird, I actually wept for Judas. I felt so sorry for him. And I feel sorry for anyone that gets relegated to a position because all of us are capable of being put in such a position. But there's a key to why Judas was finally Judas and the story was not rewritten. And that is really what we're going to focus on. And it is self-condemnation. Not the fact that he betrayed him. That's not the real sin. Let's look at these seven things. First, number one, we all do stupid things. How many of you would say amen? Amen. <laughs> if you don't raise your hand, then you don't. You think your things are not stupid that you do, but I promise you, there are dumb things that we all do. All have sinned. Everyone has faults. Matthew 26, 47 says, And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a great multitude with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign saying, Whomever I shall kiss, he is the one. Seize him. And immediately he went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you've come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. Now, I want us to consider some things about why Judas would do this. And this is the error that everyone concentrates on. This is what Judas is known for, this actual betrayal. But what led up to this? Well, we can think about certain proclivities of Judas, one of them being that he had some issues with money. He was given the bag as the treasure of the ministry of Jesus. He carried the money bag. And we know the scripture says he pilfered money from that bag. That was his weakness. Some people have a weakness when it comes to money. A lot of people have a weakness when it comes to money. That's why God had to draw the line and say, look, you either serve God or you serve money. One or the other, because it's easy to get caught in that trap of money stopping you from doing the right thing or money causing you to do the wrong thing. But if we start to try to be an advocate for Judas and help him out a little bit, we know that he, his motivation was money. He was already predisposed to be corrupt. But I also kind of think that he is not really expecting the outcome that actually occurs. In fact, he, he probably suspected that they would have never been able to really capture him. And this is the thing with the stupid things we do. We have ideas. We have thoughts about what we're doing, we do not always intend. That's why it was a dumb thing. Sometimes we think it's smart when we start. That's what errors are. That's what sins are. We feel good about a thing. We want to do that. But we don't really think about the long-term effects. Or we misproject and think that it couldn't happen. I think that possibly Judas, having been a witness to Jesus, escape people who wanted to take him by force more than once may have thought in his mind that they're never going to be able to take him. I might as well use this situation to earn some money on the side. In fact, at that very moment, in an alternate account of this story, we know that they came and said to him, Are you Jesus of Nazareth? And he said, I am. And it says they all fell backwards. And they got back up again. They asked again. Are you Jesus of Nazareth? He said, I am. I already told you that. And then they arrested him. Now, if you remember, when Jesus began his ministry, already his disciples were traveling with him. He had already began to teach and preach. And there was a moment that he shared, and he shared a very unpopular message because it was tantamount to blasphemy. And they decided to destroy him. And they brought him by force to the edge of a cliff outside the synagogue. And they were going to throw him down to his death. But what does it say happened? He turned and he walked through their midst. Anybody that you have decided to kill by throwing off of a cliff, a whole group of people, because he committed a blasphemous thing, because he said something that was so offensive, 
this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your eyes. Basically, it was a declaration of him being the Messiah. Well, they were furious at him. But in a moment, suddenly, because his time had not yet come, he simply turned around and walked through the crowd. And they were helpless to stop him. Puzzled, probably, in their mind, why aren't we grabbing him? Why aren't we stopping him? Because the Father was protecting him in that moment. And I guarantee any disciples with him filed right after him. Would you have hung out to see what would happen? No, I would have been right behind Jesus. Get out of there. What if Judas was among that group and seen that and thought, well, even if I get money from them and they come to take him, they're not going to be able to take him? There's justifications for why we do dumb things in life. We rationalize, we think it through, and if we work hard enough to convince ourselves, we can convince ourselves to do the most irrational, foolish things that you can imagine. They call a rash act here in Singapore. <laughs> Poor boy being stupid and dumb, picked up one of those rental bikes, you probably saw the video, threw it down the stairwell of a HDB, fell all the way down, like very far down. And they were laughing, and of course they post it, and that's the stupidest thing you can do in the world. It's the stupid act, but even stupider is to post you vandalizing. Now, you realize how risky that was? What could have happened? What if a child had been playing down there? A toddler, a baby, a mother, a babe in arms. That bite could kill them. You could hear it hitting as it went down. Foolish things. He probably just wanted to impress his friends, did something stupid, did this convinced himself that it was okay, but now I feel so sorry for him because he's going to serve time. And most likely after sentence, he became besides that. Foolish things that we do. There's always going to be ramifications for our actions, but I want us to think about Judas and what he's done in a deeper sense, not just look at it at face value and say, yeah, Judas the betrayer, he's so stupid. No, we, we all do stupid things. Number two, after that, we see the results of sin. It goes on in verse 3. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned. And we're going to take each part of this story. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned. At this point, he realized that his actions truly caused Jesus to be handed over to the authorities to be condemned. As I said earlier, I don't know if he was expecting this to actually take place. The way it's worded makes me think that perhaps this was a surprise when he saw that they actually did take him. Because we will always see the results of our sins. We didn't always plan it or decide it, but there will be results, there will be ramifications. People will be hurt. You say things sometimes, hurtful things, you make decisions selfishly or for yourself that affect other people in the long run and people get hurt and then you realize what you've done, don't you? When you see the results of it, even though you didn't understand. And this is a process we all go through. Sometimes we just blurt something out of our mouth and then we see the look on someone's face that we've hurt them. And when we see that they are condemned or when they, we see that they are hurt by what we do with them, we have an option there. We have a choice. Seeing the ramifications of our sins is the first step toward repentance. Nothing's going to change if you don't stay. If nothing does happen and nobody gets hurt, you're likely to continue in what might be an error for a much longer time. Because it's hidden, it's quiet, nobody knows. You do feel guilt for it, but because you've not seen it really destructive and really do what sin can do in the long run, you're still not really that worried about it, but when you see that it has an effect on someone, things change. We go to number three. We feel great remorse. When we actually do see what happens, we feel remorse. It says he felt remorse. This means that he felt pain for the action he had committed. That he committed an action by taking the money and, and telling them the one that I kiss is the one betraying him. He did it, I believe, as I said, half thinking that, that, that I can't really be able to do anything. At least I get money out of this. But now Jesus is submitting to the process. They take him and he's arrested. And this feeling comes over him. A deep pain. This word means deep pain in the heart. He, he is really 
really sorry, it's a word we throw around, sorry, meaning, oh, that feeling that you get because something's not right, because you've done something wrong, that's what he's feeling. Caused by seeing the result of our sin. Leads us to true repentance. That's part of the conviction. And this is where the subtle differences between conviction and condemnation are, are needed to be discerned. Because condemnation is at work here as well. Conviction is connected to the remorse we feel for having done something wrong. And we can walk out our repentance if we follow this path. So far, Judas is just like any of us. We do something stupid, uh, then we see the results of our sin, and we feel great remorse in step three. If you've done something wrong in the past, and then you've seen how it affected someone when you first committed the act, you didn't really think much about it, but when you see the ramifications of what you've done, then you feel sick, you feel stressed, you feel remorse. And when you do that, it leads you to step number four. We can reverse our course. In other words, repent. That's all it means. It says here in verse three that after he felt remorse, he returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Now this is a classic textbook example of what the Bible defines as repentance, a 180 degree turn. With everything you've done, you do exactly the opposite. You reverse it. He took money to betray Jesus. For whatever reason, whatever his mentality was when he did it, but now he has it, and the remorse causes him to immediately bring that money back. He wants to back up. He wants to reverse course. He wants to give it back. But of course, it's too late now. I heard my Bible school teacher say one time that uh, sin has effects. What if you're a young man and you're promiscuous with a young woman and she becomes impregnated by you and you repent of the sin? That baby is still in that womb. And that baby will grow and be born. Why? Because you committed the act that produced something. And all sin has an effect. Now I'm not calling an innocent child in mother's womb iniquity, but iniquity is similar to that. Once you commit the error, then there is byproducts to that error, problems, and you need to try to reverse that as much as possible. In this case, Judas is doing his very best by bringing back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. He gave back that silver in an attempt to show his remorse and sorrow. He wanted to be demonstrative, prove it by showing, here is a symbol of my repentance. The Bible talks about fruit of repentance. Show forth fruits worthy of repentance, it says. Like if I do something, if I break something of yours, and I just say, sorry. What does that mean? If I don't do something to recompense you. If I'm walking by and you're, play, you know, you're on your laptop, let's say you have your book, and I come by and I just you know, snag it and flip it onto the ground, the screen shatters. And then I turn to you and say, sorry, huh, and then run off. What good is that? You're sitting there turning red, angry. What did you do? If you go into the Old Testament, there's all kinds of laws written exactly about that. When someone does something, they are responsible. You do something to say you're sorry. You show it. And that's all Judas is doing. And so far, all four of these steps are exactly what we need to do. And it leads us on even into the next step. Number five, we confess our sin. Saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to that yourself. Now here is a confession. He is confessing exactly his sin. And when you have sinned, and you suffer remorse, and you see the damage that it caused, it is your obligation to identify that sin and confess it. That's where freedom comes. Absolution of sin comes from confession of the sin to the person involved, to individuals. You have to, there is a need to confess. When we have these faults, we have these problems, we need to tell someone. But I say be very careful. Judas is confessing to the wrong crowd here. Harsh, religious people that live by a code of condemnation. 
Be very cautious. You may think you'll find compassion. You may think you'll find help. You're trying to be transparent, trying to be open. You want to be real with someone, and you tell them about your errors. Some people you confess your sins to, they're going to use it against you. Dr. Rodney Hartbrown, years ago, he said that funny thing about the rabbit. You know, you go into the wilderness, you find a rabbit, you sit down by that rabbit, make sure nobody's around, and you tell that rabbit every sin you've ever committed. You confess everything to that rabbit. When you feel that your conscience is clean and the rabbit knows everything, pull a gun out and kill that rabbit. Bury it in the desert. Get back in your car and never tell another soul again. He said that from a great perspective of influence in the churches in America when revival was pouring out in the 1990s. And when he said that, it stuck with me all the time. And he told stories of why. Because sometimes... You tell someone and they, their basic thought is, what is that to us? Take care of your own problem. Deal with that yourself. One of the things that we study when we look at the difference in conviction and condemnation is condemnation gives you no way of escape. doesn't help you at all. It happily points out the error. It will define the error. It will show you the error. Satan loves it. In fact, Satan has a title in the Bible where he's called the accuser of the brethren. He loves to bring accusations. And he's very good at telling you your faults and your weaknesses and your problems. And he's very good at describing to you. If you listen to him long enough, he will paint the most eloquent picture of your sin, your error, your weakness, your inabilities. If you listen in long enough, he will make you feel so low, you would have to dig a hole to find your hole. You're deep. He will put you down to a low place. And that's his job. That's what condemnation does. Say that yourself. So the enemy will always try to persuade you to condemn yourself. Basically, it's saying you go deal with yourself about this guilt. You have this guilt, you have this problem. Nobody's going to help you. You should have thought of this when it all started out. Religion has that response. Action, love, kindness. Recently, uh, a friend of ours in Cambodia uh, had a horrible accident, cut their hand with a saw, opened the most of us no And there were two kinds of reactions to that. I heard the story of different ones. One reaction was somebody said, and I'm just quoting what I heard, that, that well, you certainly should have a healthy respect for his tools now. To me, that's, that's, that's not helpful. But someone else, when they found out, immediately embraced him and, and held him and, and, and showed great concern. And other people have banded together right here in this church to provide money to fix that hand, that's mercy. That's love. That's kindness. We could all say, well, he should have known better. Often condemnation is an easy way out of a responsibility to your fellow brother or sister in law. It's easier to just say, well, this is stupid. You should have known better. Remember what the Word of God says. Don't be deceived. God will not be mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, he will reap it. You sow that attitude toward people. The exact measure you measure out, it's coming back to you. But according to reciprocity, multiplied. What if when someone does something stupid, instead of exposing, pointing, or condemning, we cover it and hide it and protect them and make sure that they are restored? You've heard me teach before on Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You can be Ham or you can be um, Shem or Japheth. Now, Judas is in this predicament. Judas is trying to find some relief for this horrible feeling that he has, this betrayal that he has done. He realizes it. Maybe he didn't think about it entirely, about what would happen, but now that it's happened, he feels so sick about it, he's trying to repent. He says and confesses the very words, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. What is that to us? See to it yourself. And that right there is the option for us all. Do we deal with it ourselves? Do we simply take our guilt, our shame, and punish ourselves for it? 
Judas did. And we have a choice, but he chose this. It says he threw the pieces of silver into the sanctuary and departed, and he went away and hanged himself. Did the priests, did the leaders hang him? Some people might say God punished him. In fact, especially if they'd seen a display that happened afterwards, because when he hung himself from a tree, he hung there long enough, they left the body as a symbol. He hung so long that his body rotted and swelled up. When it swelled, it says he burst open and his insides poured out on the ground. They left that. How many people you think went by and said, see, that's what God does to the man that commits such a sin. Did God hang Judas? Did the religious leaders hang Judas? No, they said, see to it yourself. You deal with yourself. Judas hung Judas. Judas made the choice. He took it upon himself to take the role of judge and jury and sentence himself to death. He made the choice to punish himself the way that he felt was just. And honestly, we do not have this right. You understand what happens when you get saved, right? We receive Jesus as our Savior. Not just our Savior, but our litigator, our lawyer, and our defender. The Bible calls him our, our parakletos. We have an advocate with the Father. He stands against the accuser of the brethren. He stands against the forces of condemnation. To defend you, to protect you. If you employ him to do so. If you invite him, yield to him, keep your big mouth shut and let him take care of everything. But Judas didn't do that. And really, this was the greatest sin of Judas. Not, not, not that he betrayed Jesus. That was a horrible, horrible thing. But the real sin here is his own self-condemnation. We could follow, actually, all the steps up to this point. The first five steps are a model of how to deal with errors in your life. Everything he's doing, he's doing right up until this point where the cart goes off the rails and he takes upon himself that position as judge. Self-condemnation. And it is powerful. I'm very good at condemning myself. I'm very good at self-discipline. I can punish myself really well. And I do when necessary. There's nothing wrong with self-discipline. But there are limits to what we can do to ourselves. Because you will become your own cruelest taskmaster and I guarantee you that Satan is helping you to do it. Once you get in the habit of getting under condemnation, you will live under that condemnation. You live in darkness, always oppressed, always overshadowed. But I want us to conjecture tonight. I want us to take some artistic license and rewrite the gospel a little bit. What if it were different? We can be restored, number seven. And I, I, I asked the question, what would have happened if he, Judas, had gone to Jesus and asked for forgiveness? Think about it. You know, there was a moment. You say, well, how would he be able to talk to him? There were people talking. Jesus was hanging on the cross. He didn't die right away. He was nailed there, suffering in agony. But you've heard of the seven last sayings of Christ, right? Well, he, he's saying these things from the cross. He was conversive. He was able to hold conversations. There was a moment that John came with Mary. They stood side by side and he even designated John as a caretaker for his mother. John, behold your mother. And told his mother, this is now like your son. He was taking care of his issues before he physically left. Before he died on the cross. They were talking. What if at that very moment... We rewrite the story, and there's Jesus, suffering in anguish, hanging on the cross, looking at John, looking at Mary, and tells them, John, this now is going to be like your mother. Mother, this is like your son. Please. And then right there, all of a sudden, Judas comes between the two of them and pushes them apart. Dramatically. Falls to his knees. Jesus! Jesus! 
Forgive me. I betrayed innocent blood. I'm, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that it would really happen. I, I seen how you could escape any time, but, but I didn't mean it. I threw the money back. I gave it back. They wouldn't take it. I just, I just threw it in the sanctuary, and I'm begging you, please, 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 will you forgive me? What do you think Jesus would have done? Honestly. Beyond this, do you think Jesus, from that position, hanging there, would have said, No, you are the son of petition. <laughs> you now will suffer forever to escape a No, it would have smacked against every doctrine he ever preached. He was walking mercy. He would have said, Of course, Judas. Son, we all make. If that had happened, gosh, imagine today, right now, we would be reading the Gospel of Judas. And it would be one of the most amazing Gospels from the perspective of a person that made mistakes. And I'm crying again for a man who died 2,000 years ago because he's a symbol. He's a symbol of people that get caught up in the machines of religion condemnation and there's people out there right now that have hung themselves socially, spiritually, mentally condemned themselves and it's not God's will it's not his purpose for us if we don't represent his compassion if we don't represent his mercy absolute mercy I've been in religious circles for all these years since I've been seven. I've seen atrocities in the name of order, in the name of social perspective, in the name of saving face, in the name of protecting ministries, in the name of protecting the reputation of personalities in the church. And, and, and they've thrown people under the wheels of the bus. They've discarded human lives. Just gave up on people. Like someone once said that the church is the only army in the world that kills its own wounded. Because they have to deal with that. It imbrues the image that you carry. You now are seen. Well, they are the ones connected to what? What? Sinners? Dare we be branded the friends of sinners? It sounds familiar, doesn't it? A wine bibber, friend of sinners. Jesus was that. Jesus walked with the people who were condemned. David's whole army were men that had been condemned. God loves the condemned. And he offers, instead of condemnation, mercy. He stands to his feet. He looks condemnation in the face and he addresses it and he says, Woman, where are your accusers? Condemnation has to flee. And she says, They've all gone. And he says, Nor do I condemn you. Just go and don't do it anymore. Do the right thing. And that's exactly what Jesus would have told Judas in that day. He would have said, go and do the right thing. Judas would have gone on and have been a wonderful apostle. Peter did. Read it just these last couple of days in the, in the daily reading I've been reading through. Peter denied him. Jesus predicted that he told him, no, not so, no way, I'm, I'm going to die if I have to, I'm not going to leave your side. He said, hey, man, you, before the rooster grows, you're not denying the truth. I think he said it like that too, quickly, just kind of blurted it out. And they were like, no, and it says they all chimed in, no, never, Lord, we're with you. And Jesus was like, yeah, right, okay, let's go. And they were spread and scattered just as the scripture was fulfilled. And Peter outright denied Christ. This is the same Peter, by the way, that was told when he tried to stop that from happening to begin with that he was Satan. Peter! Great apostle, wonderful man. An, an icon of how to serve God and do great things. And his life is amazing. And we learn so many lessons from him. What if he had taken the road of Judas when he ran out after the crow 
I mean, of the rooster, and Jesus looked at him. They, he, uh, he made eye contact with him, and he says he wept bitterly, and he ran. He ran. What if in that process, what if he'd gone to the same Pharisees and asked them, or the priests, what am I going to do? I just denied Jesus. Well, you should deny him. Go see to it yourself. And then before you know it, Peter's killing himself. They find him wrapped in a fishing net, drowned dead at the bottom under his boat. Be a whole different gospel again. Different story. But he didn't. He decided it was not his place to judge himself. He just held it inside. Ashamed to face Jesus when it was all said and done, he did face him on the beach that day. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. All he said was, Peter, do you love me? He said, you know I do. He asked him again, Peter, do you love me? He told him, you know, feed my sheep, take care of my lambs. Do the work I trained you to do. Three and a half years I spent with you teaching you how to take care of, how to teach, preach the kingdom. Do that, but this there's a deeper issue that I'm trying to settle with you. Do you love me the third time? He asked me, you know that I love you. Three times, because that's how many times he forsook Jesus. That's how many times he denied him. And he was given that chance to be made right. And he was. And what a different Peter that was in the day of Pentecost that stood up and gave the explanation. This is that spoken by the prophet Joel, the one that preached and his message caused 5,000 people to get baptized in water. That was a long road from denying Christ. But we'll never see those kind of victories until we are sifted. That's what Jesus told him. Satan has sought to sift you like wheat. Bottom line is this, that he, the sin of Judas was not his betrayal, but the fact that he decided to kill himself. He took his life into his hands. He, he did not give it over to the advocate. He did not give it to Jesus Christ as his Savior. These are the things we saw. We all do stupid things. Number two, we see the results of sin. We do foolish things. We mistreat people. Whatever the case after it is there, we see the result of it, and then we feel bad about it. We feel great remorse. Number four, we can reverse our course. We can repent. And that's exactly what Judas did. He, he gave the money back. Later, he threw the money. He confessed. See, all, if you take just one through five and take off those last two, we have a formula for repentance. That's really quite effective. That's exactly what we need to do. But... He goes wrong. Number six, we have a choice to condemn ourselves and he chose to condemn himself. But we can be restored. And that's where we kind of made up our own gospel, but I'm positive it could happen. Just as Peter was put back into place, so Judas could have been put back into place. If you ever condemn yourself, if you ever are in a place if error ever occurs in your life, and you feel that kind of remorse, and you know that you are guilty, and you do something like Judas, or you do something like Peter, I'm begging you, I'm begging you, be careful who you talk to about it. Find me. Find me from anywhere on this planet, and I will stand with you. I will protect you. Tell me. Come to me. Talk to me. I've seen friends, I've seen people that I've loved that did not come to me, that they went to the wrong people, and as a result, they paid horrible prices. People who cooperated with condemnation. They didn't restore. I, I, I will restore. To my own hurt. I have lost relationships. I have lost friends because I've stood with sinners. Because I've stood with people who made mistakes to help them get back up on their feet again. When I was told by other leaders and pastors, you need to cut that off. It's going to give your ministry a bad reputation. I can't do it. I can't do it. I need to do what Jesus taught me to do. Not walk in the ways of condemnation, but walk in the conviction of the Lord and the love and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ.